Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Ad Solutions and Brand Innovation Keynote with Chief Marketing Officer, American Express, John Hayes. But first, please welcome NAPI President and CEO, Rick Feldman. Hi everybody, good morning. And welcome to our keynote with John Hayes and Peter Tortorici, thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank all of you for coming, especially John, we really appreciate it. It's an honor to have you, and Peter, thank you as well. For the past 16 years, John has led American Express's global marketing efforts and helped shape both the company and its phenomenal brand awareness. He's been the driving force behind iconic campaigns such as My Life, My Card, and has created more than 200 new product launches, including the coveted Centurion Black Card, Zinc from American Express. Often recognized by his peers for his many business and community efforts, John currently chairs the leadership committee of the National Peace Corps Association. We're honored and very proud to have John this morning, and take it away, John. Thank you, everybody. John Hayes, everybody. Thank you, Rick. Good morning. How are you? You know, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. But I have to admit, it's a little nerve-wracking as well. You know, being a corporate advertiser and attending a convention like this is a bit like being the hen in the fox house. You know, I feel like I must have a giant dollar sign tattooed on my forehead. I had no idea I had this many friends in Miami. <laughs> and all with such impressive, impressive business cards. Well, when Rick and Bobby approached me to speak today with you, I must confess that I was not quite certain how to best serve you with uh, my remarks. You see, people like me and companies like mine we put walls around the hen house. To some degree, we have to. There are just too many opportunities that come over the transom, and not enough time in the world to sort through them all. What we're looking for is just like any other marketer. We're looking for ideas and concepts that are on strategy, on target, on budget, and that are highly measurable. We employ, I think, one of the best teams, people, in the world, not only to sort through the marketing ecosystem, but to seek out the best of the best in terms of marketing communications opportunities. And then we work with our partners to execute the opportunities as flawlessly as possible. The trouble with the marketplace that everyone in this room operates in is that it's exploding with opportunity. Now I've chosen my words very carefully here. I said trouble and opportunity in the same sentence. Troubling because I see a room like this and I know maybe six people. If I'm doing my job correctly, my company should know 600 or more of you that are at this conference. Now how can we as a company, as one of the world's leading brands, comprehend how to work effectively with over 600 content producers? Potentially, it's an insurmountable challenge. It wasn't long ago when we all had to, what we had to worry about was sorting through three content providers, all of which had three easy to remember names, three letters. Now we have to know companies with names like Radical, Harpo, and my personal favorite, Magical Elves, all award-winning industry leaders. But herein lies the opportunity and the problem facing both of us. Your industry as the provider and my company as the conduit to the consumer are often so completely mismatched in the marketplace, that it seems like we will all collectively never get aligned. So congratulations. We've now arrived at the beginning of something that I like to call the content conundrum. I thought I'd spend our time today trying to give you an honest, first-hand perspective of a company like ours. At American Express, we believe that it's noble to serve and see ourselves as one of the world's foremost conduits of commerce. I thought I'd share with you how we look at your world, how you can look at ours, and how we might be able to all do more commerce together. Now, as I mentioned, at American Express, we've organized all of the branded content and sponsored programming noise out there into the heading of the content conundrum. I just had to. The static the number of people approaching us, the struggle for a common set of internal evaluation tools, all led me to institute a mantra of, guess what? No one has the right answer. 
Now that's hard in a quant-oriented financial services company like ours. We can measure everything. We have so many ways of slicing and dicing economic data that it just boggles the mind. We also have an army of extraordinarily talented analysts and economists who can then take that data and provide insight into the global economy with alarming accuracy. But when it comes to buying cable or network, Vivo or YouTube, our own programming or Conan, we're left scratching our heads. Why? Well, there's no one right solution. But there are a myriad of different options that can yield widely variant results. So we've arrived at the crossroads of the content conundrum. We've admitted that we have a problem, as any good therapist would advise. But what we need to do is to break down the elements of the conundrum and seek solutions. The content conundrum has, from my perspective, three key elements. The first is what I call how much. Now, it's from the advertiser or marketer's point of view. Namely, what is the optimal mix for my content investments? Now, this element is where almost everyone, including American Express, tends to get wrapped around its own axle. How much do I spend on unmeasurable? Let's, let's say that if you're a progressive marketer, you're now looking at your advertising budget and your content budget as one line item. I mean, I think if you're not doing this, you should go home, collect, don't collect $200 and, and retire, because it's certainly where the business is going. Now, to help prove this point, take a look at this chart from the ad age data. I know it's an eye chart, but what it says is that some of the world's finest brands are spending on average one third of their entire marketing communications budget on unmeasured spending. Now, we couldn't find the exact proportion of that spend that's used on content initiatives, but I can tell you that I was astonished to see how far most of us have come in this arena. It's just staggering. And it's also just the beginning. It tells you that marketers have been forced to seek out new ways to reach the consumer. Now, it's not just theory and predictions. It's happening in real time, and it's 33% of the spend. It should give the optimist pause and the traditionalist heart failure. Now, element two <clears throat> is, and an area that affects everyone in this room, is the question, what media or delivery vehicle is going to provide the best return for my investment? Now, this, too, is a very confusing space. Let's start by taking a look at some statistics. According to Nielsen, 52.7% of the households have HDTV. The number of people time shifting has grown to 94 million, and they're doing it an average of nine hours and 36 minutes per month. The average time spent simultaneously watching television and using the internet grew by 10% this last year to an average of three hours and 41 minutes um, per month. And that's just amongst the old folks. It's four times that if you're under the age of 25. Confused? Almost every marketer is. The more I spend on content, the more likely it's, it is to essentially be skipped through and missed by some ADD-addled ADD media junkie fast-forwarding through an episode of Jersey Shore, IMing with their friends and jacked up on Mountain Dew. Just what exactly did they catch or comprehend of my brand or my product pitch? And element three is even more basic. Who do I work with in order to be on the inside looking out instead of on the outside looking desperate and hopelessly out of touch? Now, this element is, from my perspective, where everyone in this room, including myself, is guilty of having or doing something terribly wrong. Just call Amex, they'll take care of all that. <laughs> Wasn't that smooth? <laughs> now, at the time, it was cutting edge. You know, when I look back at it now, I want to crawl under the table and die. <laughs> we worked with two of the very best producers in the business on the restaurant. 
That was back in, in 2004, and we still had scenes like that one. So there have been many, many missteps. And when we go too far, the consumer lets us know instantaneously. By the way, the response to that particular scene in the show got a lot of responses, and not many of them were positive. So the conundrum has three parts. First, how much? Secondly, where? And third, with whom? Now, I think I've addressed conundrum one. Rule of thumb in today's environment is that if you're a world-class brand run by a world-class marketing team, you should be dedicating approximately one-third of your expenditures to what is currently characterized as the unmeasurable. You must experiment, and you must push your organization to thrive on change and the evolution of the marketing mix. So within that benchmark of one-third, are you, as the content pro producer or provider, getting your fair share? Are you helping to guide your clients to where they should be? Because if not, and if this industry is not, who is? Conundrum two, the where. Now this I find to be alarmingly distressing and intuitively easy to solve at the same time. I don't want to watch a one hour piece of proprietary content on my Blackberry or iPhone. I'll watch it on my television screen, laptop, or increasingly on my iPad. I really don't care where it's distributed as long as I can get it when and where I want it. Now, unfortunately, my simple statements, as our media agency would tell you, unleash a mind-numbing torrent of permutations and possibilities that leaves us all with our heads spinning. The simple is not simple. It just needs to appear to the consumer to be so. The where conundrum will continue to be a challenge. I do think, however, that each form of media is finding its calling. In last week's New York Times, Stuart Elliott quoted David Paltrick, chief of research at CBS, as saying, television is increasingly about the development, nurturing, and harvesting of franchise programming. I think that's dead on. I mean, if you look at some of the quality of programming on networks like CBS and HBO, it's astounding. If you look at sports franchise programming, especially with the advent and the penetration of HD, it's literally better than being there in person. It's television reaching its apex in terms of a consumer experience. And with that happening, everybody wins, especially organizations like the NFL and their fans. The consumer and their habits will predict the where for American Express. We will go where they go, and we will do it seamlessly. If the experience is awkward, the brand becomes an unwanted extension of that poor experience. Now, YouTube has become the medium of content referral. We throw around the word viral, but you really know it when you see it, because it's in your Facebook feed from five other people who don't know each other, but who are urging you to spend five minutes watching something ridiculous. I mean, you know you see something, and then you tell 10 friends about it. And did you see the, 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 um, the, the video of the double rainbow guy? You say to your friends at a cocktail party, or um, at work, or on Facebook, whoa, that's a full rainbow all the way. Double rainbow, oh my god. It's a double rainbow all the way. Whoa, that's so intense. Whoa, man. Wow. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. Whatever it is, I want some. <laughs> 24 million views, a guy called Bear, and a video camera. Amazing. I mean, the ramifications of content referral for a company like ours are very significant. As we navigate the content conundrum and continue to experiment with a variety of messaging outlets and techniques, we're finding hidden value in successfully managing 
the arbitrage between types of media. Let me show you one of our most recent commercials. If you're really serious about entertainment, every detail counts. Now because, thank you. Because of the quality, the brilliant work of Conan and our agencies and the timing of the spot, we were able to get quite a lot of viral interest in the content. We could measure the response every hour and summarize it every day. The upside for us was that we were able to back down on our paid advertising spend because of the level of engagement that we were getting with this on the internet. Now go back to that sense of spend that we were tracking on earlier, the one third. Now that piece is getting bigger, but the whole pie really isn't getting that much bigger. So in content arbitrage, somebody's winning and somebody's losing. If you go back to the NFL and HD, the ratings are gaining, but the live attendance in some markets is slipping. Why? Because it's so good on television, and I can't get DirecTV's red zone in my seat at the game. As content providers, you must have an answer for all sides of the market. If I leave you with one message today, it's don't forget the arbitrage between the different types of media for the advertiser. Just because you make something for three screens, doesn't mean the level of engagement nor the economics will be evenly distributed or consumed. Conundrum number three, the with whom. This, I would guess, is the area of highest interest for all of you. There is, however, no easy answer here. I have one simple criteria when choosing a partner of any sort, whether it's a content provider or an agency, an ambassador, an artist in residence, or a, even a typesetter, and that is quality. Does the partner hold themselves up to the same standards of quality that American Express does? If, my, fee if my, my team feels that they do, then you have a good chance of working with us. My second criteria is that as a brand, we need to experiment, but only on a quality basis. So we'll go out there We'll try things, but they'll need to be done to our quality standards. I find that we learn the most in a quality environment, and it's also where we fail the least. Let me give you a peek into a couple of 2010's experiments. The first is a movie that we did with Graydon Carter, Martin Scorsese, and Fran Lebowitz. The concept was simple. Graydon wanted to do a documentary on a contemporary look at the American conversation. It's right at our target, 
it's intelligent, it's highly entertaining, and it's Martin Scorsese. I obviously love to talk, so I never thought about being good or bad at it. Only when people started remarking on it did I realize that people thought of it as anything special. You think there's a difference between a female voice and a male voice in literature? Even on the phone, there's a difference between a female voice and a male voice. <laughs> no one has wasted time more than I have. No one. I mean, I looked up, you know, it was like 1979. I looked up, it was like 2007. I thought, you know, you better get to work. There are too many books. The books are terrible, and this is because you have been taught to have self-esteem. <laughs> when I was a child, it was called talking back. You know, now it's called public speaking, you know? But it's really the same. Thanks to the quality and the great efforts of everybody that was involved in this, it was sold to our friends, uh, to our friend Richard Plepler at HBO, and will make Amex money and is hopefully the first of what we're calling the Amex Portraits series. The last example is an internet-based digital music program that we call Unstaged. Unstaged has been a magnificent success that allows our customers and prospects to experience at scale the incredible, unique opportunities we curate for our card members. What's your favorite Spike Lee joint? I did not write this. I'm just reading from the paper. <laughs> We pair, we pair award-winning directors with some of the best musicians in, in the world to uniquely capture once-in-a-lifetime experiences. And at the end of all of the, the participants win because of the mantra of quality. So we simply want the best minds in the world thinking about our brand, plain and simple. So all of you quality freaks out there, we're open for business. I'd like to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. I want to apologize for John uh, very quickly. He's got a plane to catch, and we're going to have to keep our Q&A to about 10 minutes so that he can get back to New York and the rest of his very busy day. John, for the quality freaks out there who clearly do want to be in business with you, can you give them a little bit more guidance about, in a sense, you talked about how much, you talked about where and with whom, but the what in terms of the kinds of content that your brand and your customers are most interested in? Sure. You know, we have a, a great opportunity because we know what our customers' passions are. Because the best way to understand their passions is where are they spending their money? 
And we can understand, and by the way, we never make use of individually identifiable information, but we put groups of people together based on their passions. Some people love fashion. So we do a lot of content in the fashion space. So when the, uh, the, the fashion shows around the world, we created the first ever consumer portion to view the fashion shows because consumers wanted to see it as well, as well as the trade. So we'll go in and understand our customers' passions and then we create content to deliver against those passions to create a greater level of engagement. And that's really how we focus strategically on deciding what are some of the things we should do. Now, people's lives, as you could see in that Amex portrait series with uh, Fran, you know, we've always been about the people who define our brand. I mean, you know, we have been defined by our users for many years. I mean, many of you will remember a campaign, Do You Know Me? Where our users are the ones who define who and what American Express is. So we look for the stories, we look for the things about people, and we look for the passions of our customers. Many of the people in the room here uh, see that the path to the future in terms of their own opportunity is by engaging with brands like American Express earlier in the process of development, in some cases before a program ever gets to a network. Now, the bulk of what you folks spend money on are things that are known entities. When you buy CSI or you buy 60 Minutes, you know exactly what you're buying and you're ultimately negotiating a question of price and value. If you're going to get involved so that early in the process, how do you mitigate that risk? Well, you, it, we reduce the risk. You know, I, I don't think we ever feel like we ever eliminate risk. Um, you know, I, I, I intentionally showed you one of our oops today. Um, there's always a risk in creating anything, but you know, we want to be treated like, like an investor in a project when we're getting involved right from the beginning because that's what we are. We're investing our brand, we're investing our intelligence, and we're investing our money. And so um, we believe that the best work comes out of great collaborations. And when I showed you the unstaged series, you can see some of the directors that we're collaborating with. When you look at all of the pieces of content that we've created, we work very closely with the creative community because we believe by getting involved early, we can help to shape in the early stages of a project, not in the late stages. Those are the things that we do to try to help mitigate the risk that's involved. If the person and the people we're working with are dedicated to the quality, truly spend the time to understand us and our customers, because we do know our customers, and then you know, have the ability to create something compelling, we find that you know, we're going to be in good shape. And even when we don't succeed, and we don't look for anything that fails, we look for things that succeed, but even when we don't succeed, I have to tell you, there's been so much learning that we've been able to gain from the things we've done. I mean, we did the Seinfeld webisodes back in 2004, um, you know, before people were going online looking at videos. And some of the learning we got from doing those two webisodes back then we're still making use of today. John, you talked about the, the media arbitrage between different platforms and what they deliver. In a sense, that arbitrage has been discussed by content owners and content distributors in a number of different ways. One of the more memorable ways was Jeff Zucker talking about the exchange of analog dollars for digital dimes. When you get digital views of that Conan piece in lieu of broadcast views, are those digital views as valuable to you as it would have been if it would have been airing on a network? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say they're even more valuable. I mean, if somebody's going to go through the trouble to get online, I guess it's not that much trouble, but they're taking a, the initiative, and they're going to go and seek out something that we've put out there and view it, I believe that view is worth an enormous amount because, you know, with American Express, our challenge isn't awareness. I mean, how many people here came into this room unaware of what American Express does, right? Um, however, our job is engagement. How do we engage you? We're a brand that's about relationships, and so the more we can engage you, the fact that you're engaged enough to go and seek out that content is incredibly valu valuable to us. More valuable than just seeing it, just encountering it on television during a, a TV program. That doesn't mean we don't use television advertising, but, but I would make, make it clear that the equation was more valuable for those that are seeking it out. I think it's too early to put an exact amount on this arbitrage. It's changing daily. We're in a very revolutionary time in our business, 
but I do think that there's a lot of value in having customers seek out your content. You said a little bit earlier in the earlier question about your, your desire, if you're going to be an early investor in, in content, to be treated as an investor. Uh, I, you mentioned that you had a partnership with HBO on the documentary films. Since they're a non-commercial network, w what is the nature of that partnership between you and them? Well, it really wasn't a partnership with a HBO. It was really a partnership with Graydon and, and, and Martin Scorsese and Fran. And we created the content, and then we sold it to HBO. And so um, there was a re revenue exchange there. So that was part of that deal, as well as getting the beginning of the exposure for our Amex Portrait series uh, exposed in a very high-quality you know, environment like HBO. So. You know, for us, that's where the, occasion, where the equation worked there. We look at things on an individual basis. As I said earlier, we're trying to figure out, you know, standard ways of valuing things. It's really hard. So we look at each of the opportunities we're going to go after and say, how does this return for us? How do we create, create a return on investment? In that case, it was selling content. In the unstaged piece, it's about bringing in prospects who are live, watching live streams, 17 million of them, so that they can start to get what it's like to be a card member and have access to this kind of entertainment. So we look to value the, the content itself in a variety of ways. In the Conan spot in particular, uh, it's very striking for a number of reasons, obviously, the, the nature of the talent relationship, the nature of the storytelling experience. But in a world where, especially folks who work with agencies, know that there are clients who want to tell the story about the brand and sell, 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 we don't even know that American Express is bringing us that message until the very end. H how does that work for American Express, in your opinion? Well, I wouldn't do every piece of communication that way. Um, it, it works for that particular piece of communication. You know, we, we worked with, uh, and I have to say the relationship with Conan was just tremendous. What, what a professional to work with. And, during the process of coming up with that idea, we worked through a few months of ideas that just weren't panning out. And at one point, you know, Conan and I actually had a conversation that said, you know, if we don't come up with something, that's okay too, because, you know, we just won't do anything together right now. And, you know, that's always it's something that, that, that can happen. Um, and then we came upon this idea. I think that, you know, Conan's commitment to quality as it relates to entertainment and American Express's commitment to quality as we bring our customers entertainment is just such a great parallel that I felt that that spot spoke volumes, not only about ourselves, but about Conan and that, and that, you know, bringing those two points together. And, you know, he has a following that is so strong and, and believes so much in his brand that that association proved to be very important to us. That's great. Well, in the few minutes that we have left, I'd open it up to you folks if there are questions that you have for John before he has to dash. Anyone out there? Please, get up and get to the mic. Hello. Um, I have some very unique original web content, and we're actually looking for sponsors. So what's the best way to go about approaching sponsors like you? Well, I think that... Um, the best thing for you to do is, is first to, I'd ask you to understand the things that we do and why we do the things we do. Um, you know, the people that get the furthest with us are the ones who do their homework first, and boy, it shows when we sit down with them. As I mentioned earlier, there's too many opportunities for us to sit in meetings with everyone who has an idea. So we have to go, uh, go about, you know, thinning that in practical ways. I find that people who truly spent the time to understand the way we do business, Understand that we serve the passions of our customers. Underst understand that we have a relationship with those customers. And then understand how we present ourselves and the things that we seem to do repeatedly. That if they do that homework and they come to us with a pedigree of good work, high quality, as I mentioned earlier, well then, you know, then you got a good shot at, um, at, at doing business with us. And I have a variety of people in my organization that, can, that, you, know, that you can reach out to directly um, to, 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 you know, get your idea, you know, established with us and, and so that we understand it. But when it comes from people who seem to understand us, it makes all the difference in the world. I, I can't tell you how many people come to us because they have an idea. They have no idea what we do. They have no idea what we've done. They have no idea what we want to do, but they have an idea. Well, that's nice, but you've got to help me understand why I'm going to sit here and spend an hour understanding it. And so... 
it really is when people do their homework and they say, you know, I know you did this, and this is what I think you got out of it. I know you did these other four things, and I've been tracking what you've been doing of late with this, this, and this, and you guys must be finding value by doing this. And Unstage has done that for you, and we have a web project that we're working on. Here's how we think it aligns with the things you're trying to do, what you're all about, and why it's going to give you a competitive advantage. Well, now you got my attention. That's what I'm in business to do. So I would say serve it up in a way that helps us understand it, not so much in a way that caused you to create it. Hopefully that's helpful. One more. Hi, John. Thank you for being here. Stephen Wolf Thank from you. Media Best. Um, I'd be remiss being here in Miami to not ask a Hispanic question, given your iconic brand and given that the consumers are so brand aspirational and obviously seeing where all the demographics are going. Uh, we'd love to get your perspective on the Hispanic opportunity for American Express. Hispanic opportunity is enormous for us. And uh, in, in fact, we're, we're well developed as a brand in the Hispanic community. So um, it's not an unrealized opportunity for us. Um, there's a lot that we're doing from a marketing standpoint. We do a tremendous amount in segments, whether that segmentation be uh, based on ethnicity or gender or age or many other things. Um, we spend a lot of time because, again, we've got tremendous data to understand what people are doing based on different segments. So segmentation is very important to us. The Hispanic segment is one of those critically important segments. Um, as we continue to build and experiment in the content business, most of what we've done to date has been mainstream uh, scale plays. Um, as we are now moving more and more into segment plays. So we're looking for what are the key segment plays that we might be making. So I would say stay tuned on that. John, thanks very much for coming and spending so much time with us, and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much.